Science says matter cannot be created, yet a magician goes... London, 1862. A revolutionary optical stage illusion is premiered. A transparent ghost appears and disappears in front of the audience's very eyes. The idea of making something appear and making something disappear is a basic, basic plot for magicians. Pepper's ghost sent magicians on a quest for invisibility, which included the developing technologies of cinema and television. We can't do anything outside the law of physics. We have no powers that you don't have. We just know a little bit more about how to scam. This is the story of how magicians have taken scientific advances and used them to conjure up new ways to make things appear and disappear. I think magic is a metaphor for life, you know, and at the beginning there's a big change, nothing is there and then something is there. And at the end there's another big change, something is there and then it's gone. But between birth and death, it's change every, every day of your life. At the end of the 18th century, a new craze gripped Europe, a frightening entertainment that exploited our ancient dread of death and the afterlife, but which used very modern technology, the magic lantern. Optics can be used to create the appearance and disappearance of, of people. It can also be used to produce ghosts. Phantasmagoria was the creation of H.N. Gaspar Robertson. He claimed he could bring the dead back to life. Now, you wouldn't buy a ticket for this show. You would be met on the side of the road, and then you'd be led through a graveyard. He would take you through brambles and thorns and over broken down tombs and, and gravestones. And the whole process would disorientate you. You would be led through a door into a space which looked like a chapel. The illusion must have been enhanced by the atmosphere, this spooky, chilly, sepulchral auditorium. And then suddenly... <laughs> it clearly was a magical appliance because it would make things appear and disappear. Lantern slides were painted with images of the ghosts on, and this was then projected onto a gorse screen. He also used a lantern which moved on a truck so that the image could suddenly <coughs> appear to rush towards the audience. <coughs> that was one of the first examples of an optical show, a show that was all designed around optical effects to create optical illusions for the audience. Magicians are always looking around for different ideas uh, for their new act, uh, things that will draw the public into their performances. So I think, to a certain extent, magicians have drawn on scientific principles and actually used them as the covert operation of their, of their magic principles. Magic doesn't exist in a vacuum. It survived only when it's kept up to date, playing on the latest hopes, fears, interests, and knowledge of the audience. The Magic Lantern was only the beginning. Magic entered its golden age at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. And there's been a huge hunger for new illusions and innovative techniques ever since. 
you've got to remember in the 18th century, there was a lot of scientific progress at that time, so more and more people were becoming familiar with scientific principles. And in the early 19th century, the Industrial Revolution uh, took off. And uh, around them, they were seeing all the time scientific discoveries and progress. The 19th century world was fascinated by the possibilities of mechanization. This threw up a new type of magician who had scientific interests. The number one inventor um, in the world of magic, I would think, was Robert Houdin. Jean Eugène Robert Houdin is generally regarded as the father of modern magic, and it could be said that without him, even this program would not exist. He was a clockmaker, uh, a designer of magic, and he could perform, so he was a triple threat. Before him, magicians had a rather lowly status, regarded as charlatans from the dark ages of superstition. But Robert Houdin brought a new respectability and technical innovation to the craft that influenced generations of magicians to come. In the middle years of the 19th century, he opened a small theater of magic and fashionable society flocked to see his very individual wonders. One of the highlights of Robert Dan's performances were these magical automata. And automaton is a, is a fancy word for wind-up figures, clockwork figures. But Robert Dan's automata built on that and became magical. And they did things that no mere watchwork could have done. One automata that nobody could fathom was Antonio Diavolo, a mechanical puppet who possessed lifelike agility and appeared to be operating alone, isolated on a swing. He was called Antonio Diavolo after a famous circus trapeze performer of the day. Do understand that when Robert Houdin was working this, he was not using electricity. There were no computers to help him. Diavolo wowed the audience, which never quite knew whether he was acting alone. Robert Houdin's skill was such that people were prepared to believe he could indeed have created an automatic person who could actually think for himself. So the real art of Robert Houdin was not in building these clockwork devices, it was in taking the notion of a clockwork device and then changing it and making it magical for his audience. As soon as they thought this was an ordinary automaton, this was an ordinary wind-up motor operating this, they were fooled very badly because he had amazing secrets that were concealed inside those devices. The magic world today has its own equivalent of Rubber Houdin and John Gorn. When you see the stage shows of people like David Copperfield and Siegfried and Roy and Doug Henning, you can bet your life that most of their major props have been made by John. He is the ultimate magical craftsman. But he spends all his spare time recreating the magic of Rubber Houdin. Okay, uh, we have here the blooming orange tree of Robert Houdin from around 1845. Now he would start off his performance by borrowing a handkerchief from a, a lady and from another lady, her ring. It would go inside the cloth like this, fold it up, put into this silver chalice over here and start the magical tree. Set on fire, and as the smoke comes up through the tree, we see it start to bloom. Yes, you can see the orange blossoms come onto the tree. And slowly, yes, we start to see oranges appear on the tree. And the attention is called to the orange up on top, and lo and behold, it would open, and two butterflies would bring out the barred handkerchief with the barred ring inside. Very poetic. There was always more to Robert Houdin's automata performances than mere mechanics. 
these inscrutable machines provided fantastic misdirection opportunities for this accomplished performer, allowing him to combine clockwork with traditional sleight of hand magic to create the final effect. Automata became all the rage. In London, British magicians were soon creating similar mechanical marvels. For your amusement, apparently self-sufficient, mechanized people could play you at chess, paint your portrait, soothe you with music, or even beat you at whist. Life itself was being simulated. The fascination with all of these things, I think, was the growing sophistication of the public uh, and fascination of the public with the wonders of science. In the 19th century, scientists became A-list celebrities and London's Royal Polytechnic Institution was a hot venue. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Royal Polytechnic. The Polytechnic wasn't really a theatre, it was more a lecture hall. This was a venue where people would go to be educated at a level of popular science of the day. And there, a lot of ideas were developed. For example, Pepper's Ghost. Very clever, very clever indeed. John Henry Pepper was the entrepreneurial director of the Polytechnic in the mid-1800s. He came across a novel visual illusion that he thought would attract the public to his lectures. Pepper's Ghost was to launch a new wave of optical magic effects. What they saw was the interaction on the theatre stage of a real, live human being, flesh and blood, with a spectral image of another actor who was able, a little like the Cheshire Cat, to fade in and out of view. We know that Lewis Carroll observed Pepper's Ghost and was himself a magician. The Cheshire Cat may well have been based upon that experience. It must have been absolutely incomprehensible to those people watching it. It was a real Victorian entertainment in the way that we don't have them today. You know, it was something that appealed on a scientific level, it appealed on an educational level, and yet it was absolutely sensational. I've been very tantalised by the use of Pepper's Ghost, and I suspect I get asked to create it more than any other stage effect. So here we've got a little uh, cardboard model of, of a theatre. It's probably somewhat more elaborate than would have been the stage at the Royal Polytechnic. But what the audience would have seen is the curtain rise on a scene not unlike this. And from the wings, perhaps, an actor would walk on. Here we have a, a very glamorous ballerina. And then suddenly, to the audience's eyes, a ghost would appear. There were two things that weren't uh, visible to the audience at the beginning of this scene. The first was um, a large piece of glass, uh, which, in fact, they were looking through. And the other thing was this large pit. So the actor would be in readiness in the pit, but he would actually be invisible to the audience until such a time as he was illuminated. And this was partly because glass is actually a very poor reflector of light. It needed a brilliant light upon the ghost to actually make him appear. He would then glide across the stage, pushed on the trolley that he was lying back on, and at the other end of the stage, at the moment he should disappear, the lights would be turned off and he would vanish. The ability to see a ghost, to really see a ghost walking on stage, was something that people had fantasized about and they had never actually been able to realize on the stage. Pepper's intention was to explain to the audience how it had been accomplished. And he heard the gasp from the audience. He heard the applause and he heard that amazement from them. And at that moment, he really became a magician because he realized that he couldn't take this away from them. And so he closed the performance and he never explained to his audience how the ghost was produced and it remained his secret. Magicians and illusion designers owe Pepper the Scientist a huge debt. His work with reflections started them out on a quest for invisibility, an important theme that has stayed with magic ever since. The next occasion we see Professor Pepper encroaching upon the territory of the stage magician is three years later when he presented the Proteus Cabinet.
a brand new illusion which was to revolutionise magic uh, for the rest of the century. This was a cabinet that stood well forward of any scenery. It was raised above the ground so trapdoors could possibly come into play. There was no way anybody could be concealed in this cabinet. But the Proteus cabinet was really the first use of mirrors in, in, in a magic illusion. And, and it is what we might describe as a vanishing cabinet. It's probably where the whole idea of a vanishing cabinet came from. And this was much more useful to magicians because you could put somebody inside it, close the doors, open it, they disappeared. It was also much more portable. You know, there was something that could be wheeled onto the stage, was self-contained and could be wheeled off again. So this was uh, really an important link and it was, it was more significant, I think, than Pepper's Ghost in directly going into the repertoires of magicians. Magicians everywhere recognized that Proteus was an amazing idea because it finally combined optical principles and mechanical effects in a way that created a very durable, versatile illusion. And there was almost anything that could be done with Proteus when you really mastered the ability to make someone appear and disappear on stage. So suddenly, the whole idea of optics on a stage was within their grasp. They could really master invisibility, and now there was a whole new field opened up to them and a whole new range of effects for the first time. It was really the original magic cabinet, the cliché of the magic cabinet that magicians use today where it's a girl goes inside of the cabinet and it's closed up and it's opened up and they've disappeared. That started in 1865 with the Proteus Illusion. Although the magic cabinet might seem cliched today, when new, it caused a sensation. Now, the popularization of science in that way, uh, of course, had a tremendous effect on people, and it stimulated magicians too. And uh, one of these, who became the most famous name in uh, British magic, that of John Neville Maskelyne, from 1873 then took over in the Egyptian hall in Piccadilly. He also could uh, produce ghosts and effects, but by different means. The Egyptian hall was just a short walk from the Polytechnic, but it was a world away in terms of presentation. Maskelyne whipped up potentially dry scientific effects, adding Las Vegas-style excitement, humor, and razzmatazz. They found the ideal showplace. It was old, it was mysterious, it had all the fusty little accoutrements that told people that it was a great, great place of wonder and exotic marvels. And the stage was the perfect size for those mysteries, a tiny, tiny little stage in which an optical illusion was enormous and important, and even a bit of sleight of hand could look fantastic. A dedicated theater of illusion like Egyptian Hall came with hidden advantages. There were an enormous number of uh, technical elements uh, in the theatre which were, which were very helpful. You had a whole world of hidden machinery under the stage, above the stage and in the wings, as well as uh, infinite numbers of, of, of hidden assistants that could be working, they could be tugging threads from under the stage right in front of the audience's eyes. But the cleverest methods are nothing without a commanding performance, and Maskelyne's theatre was graced by one Colonel Stoddair, who came bearing the mysteries of the East. The Sphinx captured the popular imagination more so than the Proteus cabinet. It was written up in all the magazines of the day, became the subject of cartoons, political caricature. An illusion was good if it was intriguing and mysterious, but it could be great if it was in the hands of a great magician. And London rushed to see Colonel Stoddair at the Egyptian Hall. And the build-up to this was wonderful. The advertisements in the Times said, the Sphinx has just left Egypt. And it continued in this vein, and then eventually, on a day-by-day -day basis, the Sphinx has arrived at the Egyptian Hall. And it created an absolute sensation.
Audiences had been accustomed for many years to seeing magic tables that had long tablecloths on them so assistants could be concealed. But when Soder performed the Sphinx, he made it a point of using a very simple wooden table with simple thin legs so that everyone saw that it was isolated in the middle of the stage and there was no one that could approach it without being seen. He then opened the front door of the box and there inside was the apparent effigy of an Egyptian. And Stoder very pointedly retired to an edge of the stage. Sphinx, awake. And then to the surprise of the audience, this effigy's eyes opened, looked around. Everyone through the very small theater in Egyptian Hall, you could hear the gasp of recognition that it really was a living head. The head was undoubtedly alive. And it spoke and nodded. He closed the door again, and with some patter that uh, these things go back to whence they came, opened the door again. The head had gone, and all that was left was a little pile of ashes. So gradually there was a kind of building recognition during this presentation that this was not just a trick, not just an illusion. This was really a miracle. Stoder had shown people something they'd never seen before and that they never thought was possible. Now, the interesting thing about both the Proteus cabinet and the Sphinx is that the same method, the same secret, can serve us to totally different effects. But beyond that, I'm not going to say any more. But it was John Neville Maskelyne who really established the vanishing cabinet. Lords, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Egyptian Hall. Will, the witch and the watchman, was based on the tale of a sailor who is thrust into jail. The act was so popular, it was performed over 10,000 times. The amazing thing about Will, the witch and the watchman cabinet was that Maskelyne took a simple idea that had been first exhibited at the Polytechnic, and he made some amazing optical and mechanical improvements in it. Very complicated sketch in which several characters uh, vanished and got tied up and reappeared. There was a village maid and a handsome swain, watchman, a butcher, a witch. They could reappear, transform uh, and disappear, uh, you know, in the blink of an eye. Masculine and Cook had successfully married technological innovation with a winning performance. And then to make it fun and to make it topical, what Masculine did is he dropped in one more character, which was a gorilla which is a complete non sequitur for us today, but we have to realize that in that time, in the 1860s, gorillas had just been exhibited in London. The first specimens of gorillas had come back. And Masculine and Cook didn't quite get it right. Their gorilla had a long tail. And one of the plot points is that the gorilla's tail is cut off by the butcher during the course of the action. A zoological inaccuracy that lent a useful twist to the plot's tale. A hundred years later, a magician, an ape, and a box were to captivate an audience for a second time. So what have you found? <laughs> Normally on this show we do not give away our deadly secrets, ladies and gentlemen, but in truth, as all the magician's tricks are supposed to be done, this one was done with mirrors. <laughs> Mesdames et Messieurs, mon fils. But sometimes performers have misled audiences intentionally by keeping one step ahead of public knowledge and exploiting scientific ignorance. Magicians often bamboozle the public with supposed science explanations for what they're doing. Perhaps the most notable of these was Robert Houdin with his demonstration of the ethereal suspension in which he suspended his son on a single pole, supposedly under the influence of ether. Ether, uh, well, chloroform, really, had just come into the marketplace and everybody was talking about the mysterious powers of this stuff, this ether. He said the properties of ether made an individual lighter than air, like a balloon. 
And so he had a bottle of it and he waved it under the nose of his son and then the, the boy floated in the air, you know. Now, to further the illusion, in the wings, uh, genuine ether was being poured onto a hot shovel so that the vapour would come over the footlights to the audience and create the real atmosphere. And so Robert Dan used the suggestion of ether during his levitation to make it topical and to, to feed on this debate. Actually, Ether had nothing to do with it, and part of the debate that he aroused was whether he would subject his son to this dangerous gas and whether he was doing this every night. But actually, all of that was a deception. Magicians weren't respectable. Everybody was very interested in science, and very few people understood very much about it. Magicians took on a bit of respectability by presenting themselves as scientists, as Dr. So-and-so, you know. I need a volunteer. The most colourful of these characters was the electrifying Dr. Walford Bodie. Bodie was a charlatan. Dr. Walford Bodie, MD. It didn't stand for Doctor of Medicine. It stood for Merry Devil or Master Deceptionist. Dr. Walford Bodie, the bloody surgeon. Bodie exploited ignorance and made outrageous claims about his abilities to control and tame that newfangled and dangerous discovery, electricity. I think that Bodie would have really done anything to get an audience into a theatre. He claimed to be able to withstand the most astonishing uh, amount of electricity passing through his body uh, and also claimed to be able to cure the, you know, the sick and the paralysed. Trust me. No! They used to get someone, uh, supposedly, out of the audience, put them into the electric, electric chair and, and, and fry them, essentially. And he was kind of capitalising on the popular backlash against, you know, how cruel this was. He used uh, the properties of electricity, which, of course, at that time were a completely unknown entity to the vast majority of the populace. And uh, the knowledge that a high voltage combined with a low amperage uh, is not harmful in any way. Ah! Of course, people are always uh, very keen to see a bit of cruelty on the stage, and still are today. Um, in actual fact, he, he was playing with his idea that he knew the audience would know a bit about electricity, but not enough to probably be ahead of him. And, of course, that is pretty much a staple even of magicians today. Magicians are rarely daunted when a whole new technology opens up magical possibilities. Most magicians have always taken science very seriously they, because we, we like to keep up with the latest developments. I mean, when there's something new comes on the, on the horizon, uh, we say, can, can I do a trick with that? We've always been in the, in the forefront of the novelty things that there are. We tend to be pretty up-to-date. I mean, Devant uh, brought film to, to London, you know, the cinema. Maslin Cook were well established at the Egyptian Hall when, in 1893, they employed for the first time a, a man whom everyone who saw him regarded as the master. David Devant was Maskelyne's protégé and was to become the founding president of the Magic Circle. He was also, in many people's opinion, the greatest British magician ever. David Devant represented the new age in magic. Devant's fascination for pictures of all kinds led to his interest in the emerging moving picture industry. So ironically, the very earliest cinema is being shown and perpetuated and exhibited by magicians. Pioneers in this was a man called Georges Méliès, who was a magician. In fact, he'd been intrigued by visiting the Egyptian hall and seeing Masculine and Cook with their mysteries. He came across the most amazing discovery. He 
he used magical thoughts but created them using editing uh, so the people would vanish pow, and reappear pow, uh, because of his editing, you know, freeze the frame, get out of the shot, continue the shot, freeze the frame, bring him back. That's how he did the stuff. And he developed, they say, 80% of the science that is used now in making movie effects. He does an illusion with his head on a table, which is a very similar image to the Sphinx of just a generation earlier. Many of these trick films, many of the special effects that we now take for granted really grew out of magic shows. They were techniques being used by magicians that were transferred to the film. So you can see all of the analogies of Pepper's Ghost, all of the reflected images in the superimposed image. And you can see the various elements that were used to create that were transferred by George Melies right onto the film. He was using the same formula of light objects and dark objects, of lit areas and darkened areas. The same formula that was being used for Pepper's Ghost was put on film. I think in many ways, many of the, the special effects and the experiences we have in, in cinemas are a little bit like magic tricks. That if you don't understand, you have never encountered that particular trick before, it will fool you. So as a modern audience, we look back at the turn of the century films and think, my goodness, how could anyone become absorbed in this? It looks absolutely terrible. But as a modern audience, we go to an IMAX theatre, we experience 3D, and it completely blows us away because it's new technology. If moving pictures were magic, then television itself was a miracle all of its own. The magic land of Alicazan is one for everyone. Mark, well Along comes a new science, um, which created a new theatre. Um, and it's called television. It's the thing you're watching, folks. And it's about this big. I'll lift the lid like this. Mark Wilson was America's first big like TV so. magic star. One of the great advantages of magic on television can be... Uh, that the entire audience is contained in an area about this wide. You see, that's that television lens right here. The roof comes off, and inside, wait a minute, inside, inside is nothing because Basil has disappeared. And in the same way as Melier before him, David Nixon, one of Britain's first TV magic stars, was excited by TV's technical possibilities. Thank you very much. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and good evening. How are you? All right? What David Nixon realised, of course, was that television gave him a whole new box of tricks and that it was possible to perform a form of technical trickery which he christened switchcraft. And, of course, it wouldn't be a Christmas tree without a fairy on the top. And right at the start of his show... David would have his hand like this, and a little girl would be... Well, she was a big girl, really, but she was only this big, and she would be dancing. Today, it's hard to imagine what an impact a simple editing trick like this could make in the early days of TV. But I think he soon realised that if you started mixing camera trickery and, as it were, stagecraft or stage trickery, that the audience didn't really know where one stopped and the other began. I think it's always very problematic to take magic and place it on television. I think the viewers always feel one removed. There's always that notion, but well, if I was really sitting in the audience, I'd be able to work out what's going on because they understand that um, television producers can use some sort of uh, uh, television trickery, some sort of camera trickery, or choose their angles very carefully. Sometimes television loses the magic for us. 
Supposing you put a lady in a box, right? and then you go over to, to uh, another table to pick up something, and, and the camera pans with uh, the person to the table. Well, it's, you know, while that's happening, the lady's got out of the box and has changed, and, and, and you, know, you could load an elephant like that. So a number of very ingenious magicians created the ground rules that made magic work on television, doing it with a live audience, doing it without any trick photography, giving them a sense that they're really there watching it happen. At the height of his career, Paul Daniels was attracting 15 million viewers every week using this approach. One of my balloons at this stage. <laughs> it was a mark of discipline of the Paul Daniels magic show through the years that no camera tricks were ever performed. Now, this is camera three, and this is big. But we yeah. sort of broke with the rule on and one occasion. Camera. It wasn't a camera trick, but it was a trick with a camera. And just look through there, wave at the folks at home, and that's called camera four, you see. So you just give a wave, see, like that. There you are. Right. Yep. You're a star. So we put the cameraman and the cameraman in there, right? Now he's poking out through a little hole, uh, you know, shooting through a little hole, and he's shooting the person we've got on the stage, you know. Now the cable, as you can see, goes out the bottom, but we place this baton... Ooh, splinters. We place the baton across there and into there, and that locks the doors more effectively than most things. And I'm going to just have a little wave in there at the camera. Are you all right in there, Doug? Fine! Oh, thank goodness for that. And just, <laughs> just come round there yourself. You can have a little wave yourself. Wave, you! So now this, this camera is pointed round the whole uh, set, you know, so, so you, you realise that as, it, as it's moving, it is taking pictures of the set and so on. And we reverse it up so now the people can see all the way around it who are here in the studio. I promised you a camera trick. This is a trick with a camera. Three, two, one... Doug Henning's World of Magic, starring Doug Henning. Well, Doug Henning was, was a special type of guy. Here's a guy that really believed in, in magic. Doug Henning was America's preeminent star of the 1970s and was the first to have huge, extravagant TV magic specials built around him. Now, ladies and gentlemen, something you'll never forget. In a few moments, you will see the elephant go! You know, if they like you, they'll like the magic. And I think most people really liked Doug. <laughs> a lot of the, you know, illusions that we've seen on television, a lot of people say, gosh, that's just not magic. It's the magic of television that actually does that. Has television been a help to your craft or actually been a well, it's it. been a great help because just imagine in one of our television shows, more people see me than saw Houdini in his whole lifetime. So it's very important to spread the magic. But also you have to be very careful that people don't expect trick photography and think it is. So I always try to do my shows in front of a live audience or do live shows. Like, this is a live show, so nobody could kind of gimmick the tape or anything like that. But although trick photography is an unacceptable lie to audiences, there is a different kind of lie that does rest at the heart of the relationship between the magician and his audience. Magicians are the only group of professionals in the world that lie to you and are honest about it. Here's a little trick with four ordinary wooden rings. The fellow had an ordinary handkerchief, and he put this handkerchief in his right-hand pocket. Your audience goes in to a theater with the understanding that they are going to be fooled, 
that they're going to see something that's not real. And they're saying, bring it on, show me. He's up to his hanky hanky tricks again. And by the way, customers, all the tricks are Ericsson, honest engine. Some people want to have that moment of regression where they recapture that childlike wonder that we all had when we were kids. Right up on top of the bird, and your other hand on the front of the cage, and your other hand Boy, on the Matt back could of the cage. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. I'm terribly sorry. I didn't Why didn't you all tell me that this was going to happen? <laughs> Would you do that again for us? Where, where is it? That's what all the girls say. And I say <laughs> when people watch a magic trick, they tend to fall into one of two categories. Some people think they really, really want to know how the trick is achieved. It's, it's like a puzzle and it just really annoys them not knowing. The other group just don't want to know. They enjoy the magic. At first, you might think that those people should stay well away from a Penn and Teller show. Next stage. Penn and Teller have got this terrible uh, reputation of giving away secrets. But it's not that simple. They use the notion of explaining how tricks are done and they stand it on its, its ear. In other words, they use that, that intrigue that an audience has to further their own deceptions. Show them how it's done, brother. There are, there are no secrets in magic. There are no real, honest to goodness secrets in magic. When a, when, a, when a box gets pushed out on stage and a woman comes out of it, everybody in the audience knows she was hidden in the box. You may not know how to build it. But you don't. You, you know she was hidden in the box, and for some reason, magician thinks it's a deep mystery. Whereas nobody knows how their TV works. People don't know how their toaster works. For Christ's sake, you know it's and that's like oh the refrigerator. How's it getting cold? Well, we're keeping that a secret from you. You don't have to. No one cares. Penn and Teller are no longer the bad boys of magic. There's a more recent form of disclosure, far more troubling to magicians. I would never deliberately reveal a secret to the general public. There are people who do it because it's a really easy way to make a living. To be, It's that simple. They're not very clever at doing it, so they think it's clever to reveal the secret. You're about to see one of the world's top magicians break his code of silence and reveal some of magic's most closely guarded secrets. He will be known only as the masked magician. First, the elephant is there. Then he's not. Have you figured it out? Well, here's how the trick is done. Now, the magicians at first were very, very angry. Of course, they were angry uh, with me because they didn't understand uh, my involvement, the truth behind my involvement. For his first trick, the masked magician will turn one of his assistants into a tiger. The magician selects an assistant and puts her into the cage. And when the curtains are removed, our assistant has been turned into a 500-pound tiger. The message that it sends is the wrong message. It just, you shouldn't be saying that to people because you're, 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 you're spoiling it for them. The idea is to prove to the audience that the lantern is empty. When a magician goes to these lengths to prove his point, you know he's up to something. It's time to change. It's, it's time to... The audience needs something new. They want to see new things, and magicians need to think and not rely on uh, illusions that other magicians have created, you know, 30, 40, 50, 60, 100 years ago. Now that we've shattered some of magic's greatest illusions, hopefully this will encourage magicians everywhere to come up with bigger and even more impressive tricks. And who knows, maybe someday we'll show you how those tricks are done too. But in this day and age with internet and magic shops and, and magicians uh, willing to write books, the concept of the secret is really no longer a secret when you really look at it. Okay, let's let the cat out of the bag and show you how the trick is done. You can always go to the library and you can always open up a book and you can always go to a magic shop and you can always find how simple those secrets are. But people don't do it, and the reason people don't do it is because it's not very interesting. So exposing secrets is a kind of formula for disappointment, and it always has been.
we can't do anything outside the law of physics. We have no powers that you don't have. We just know a little bit more about how to scam. And the scams have grown to gargantuan proportions as magicians vie to outdo each other, vanishing bigger and bigger objects. Determined not to be outdone, David Copperfield is always upping the ante. No! But there are always rivals. Uh, there's another, another magician who does similar things, who's still doing these things, like Franz Harari, who banished the Taj Mahal. That's, I mean, that's wonderful stuff, but um, it does take a lot of swallowing. To me, size matters. And I think that where people uh, balk at the idea of trying to make something that is a fix, like a building or, a, or architecture or, or a mountain, disappear, well, I think we live in an age where people uh, take it for granted. Look, um, the Taj Mahal is not going to disappear. It's not moving. Even if you got all the permissions and paperwork, you're not taking it anywhere. But it is conceivable that it could become invisible. We invited Franz Harari to perform a new illusion for this program. It promises to be the biggest disappearance ever on British soil. How's the hair? Is the hair good? Yep. Hair's good? Okay, good. I'm obviously here in London. That would be the Tower Bridge. And the reason I'm here is uh, for the past 15 years or so, I've made, a, I've made a pretty good name for myself doing a mega magic or, or mega illusions. A couple of years ago, I made the Taj Mahal disappear. Before that, it was the space shuttle. It's sort of become my thing. And I thought the Tower Bridge is such a, a universal icon. It is so emblematic of, of England that it'd be great to, to do something with this. Here it is. Ta-da! So what I did is I called three friends of mine who I've known forever. And whatever happens or wherever it goes, they're going to be right there with me. I know we talked about doing something that's very gritty here, like we get passers-by. We're doing it for a certain amount of people in a certain location. The illusion will not happen for everybody in London. It will only be for people at that location. Most illusions are over in the blink of an eye, but all rely on careful planning and a plausible setup. All right, let's get everything out of here. Yeah. You know what, guys? We're going to need a hell of a lot more space than this. Once you understand the formula, once you get the formula, and more importantly, the psychology, it doesn't matter if you know the secret or not, because beyond that, your brain is still going to mistranslate what it sees. I can tell you that we're going to use a certain amount of geometry, a certain amount of um, um, loss of depth perception, and a certain amount of color relationship. This is a mirror. These are common in bathrooms in the United States. You got, you got, right there. Good, 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 good. I think a little deductive reasoning will tell you we're not going to slide a giant mirror in front. But um, if you think about it, the geometry of human vision tells you that the further an object is away, the smaller it becomes in relationship to the rest of your environment. So without giving it away to you, the mirror may not need to be, you know, uh, 20 stories tall, you know. Making something appear to disappear is the key to the success of a big-scale illusion. I think uh, vanishing the Statue of Liberty is still one of the most talked about illusions in uh, modern-day television magic. We constructed two scaffolding towers on Liberty Island in front of the statue and had a helicopter to give an aerial view of the illusion. David asked me, what do you think about this? I'm going to do the vanishing... Statue of Liberty, and I said, well, Dave, I, I don't know whether you should do I mean, there's going to be right in the middle of New York, uh, people are all around, and uh, maybe they'll see it vanish on the television show, but they're not going to see it vanish 
for real with all these people around all the time. I didn't like uh, the Statue of Liberty Vanish. Uh, it didn't mean anything to me. I, I sum it all up by my dad when uh, I called him up and said, are you going to watch Copperfield vanish the Statue of Liberty tonight? My dad said, well, you know he's not going to vanish the Statue of Liberty. I think that's everything right there. Of course these things aren't really happening. The whole thing is a fantasy that there's a person called a magician who can create these wonders and that you're there the night that it happens to happen, the night where everything is wonderful and you've seen this miracle. It was an interesting project and uh, we, we built it right here at our shop and it's, it was a monumental piece as you, as you can imagine. <laughs> works on the level of a human being. So normally, if one actually created a stage around the Statue of Liberty and performed that, the magician would be lost. The magician would be an insignificant part of that. But now on television, David Copperfield was able to frame himself in the foreground, frame the statue in the background, keep everything in focus, and keep everything part of the same image. And so for the first time, a large illusion like that was actually feasible and could be performed and could be presented with the same analogies of classic magic. One of the things that's come out of television magic is, is an understanding that audiences are, are quite sophisticated about what they're watching. I think what they understand is that they're watching a master magician and a masterful optical illusion that he's created, that he's mastered, and he's presenting to you. That is the suspension of disbelief that I'm asking for my audience to buy into. I'm not saying, look, you know, I'm going to make Buckingham Palace vanish. It's not going to disappear. But it is possible that to your reality, for a brief moment, however long it may be, I can make it appear that it has been visible. All right, let's do it. Bottom line is, what you see becomes your reality. Clearly no illusion will work unless there's an audience there to see it. Franz Arari's next step is to decide where his illusion will be viewed from. I think you and I need to go downstairs and check out in here. What we figured out is we're going to have to triangulate off of the bridge itself. And what that means is that somewhere out there is going to be our point of the triangle where the illusion is going to be affected. Okay. We'll see what it looks like with the laser. Unless you've got some, some great location from the gods, I think this is our spot. What do you find over there? Yeah, it looks pretty good from over here. Very clear view of the, uh, the tower. I'm going to come over to your side and see what we got, all right? In order to figure out our exact, uh, the exact angle of our equipment for the uh, illusion we performed, we're going to have to triangulate with uh, a beam of light, a laser beam, actually, from location and bounce it off two points from the uh, bridge itself. Okay, I think we're gonna have the mirror come back a little bit more. All right, well, this is cool. This is it. So let's say we set everything up right over here, okay. right? Okay. We place, we place our lock right over there, and this kind of becomes our zone here. Yeah. Our audience's field of vision for this illusion is gonna be somewhat narrow, in fact, really narrow. So we need to be pretty accurate where I'm going to be and where our audience is going to be. Roy, yeah, Roy. What we need to do is we need to see if we can hit that first mirror on the south, well, near the south tower. All right, let's do it. Laser test number one. Rock and roll. Here we go. Live the dream. Oh! Hey, that's, <laughs> that sucks, huh? <laughs> the idea here was that with a single laser and three points, we would be able to triangulate the exact location, uh, which right. we're real close. I have a suggestion. I think uh, to get a more definite point of reference, I think we may want to just switch back to the old method. You want to use real old-fashioned surveying equipment? Well, it'll be more reliable than this right now.
Most people assume that they're fairly sophisticated observers, that they're very good at noticing what's going on around them. But in fact, that's not the case. We make assumptions all of the time. We're not as sophisticated as we like to believe we are. So in our heads, when we see a magic trick, we think, wow, this must involve mirrors and lasers and all sorts of sophisticated technology because you'd require that to fool somebody as clever and as uh, observant as, uh, as my good self. Magicians have often taken general scientific ideas and suggested very openly to their audience that that's how they're using these things, um, when in fact the method is, is something perhaps much more basic or, or totally different. What a magician is doing is just showing us how many assumptions we're making on an everyday basis. Optical conjuring aside, there is no doubt that 21st century audiences continue to hunger for miracles. Listen, we're going we're gonna to drop off uh, Doug and Seth. It's the day of Franz Harari's illusion. Although Tower Bridge may have stood undisturbed for 110 years, today may be different. Doug, you there? Come here, Franz. It's showtime. You got a whole thing? Yep. If you can see Doug and Seth on either one of those um, caissons, we found our, our triangle, and this is pretty much what's going to what's going to determine where our kind of zone of the illusion, of the effect, is going to be. It gives us about somewhere between 20 and 30 feet. The only thing we're missing is, a, is an audience. Ultimately, magic is all about the effect on the audience. It's about creating a, a moment of wonder in the audience's mind. That is really where the magic occurs. It occurs in the minds and the expressions of the people watching. And that also becomes the prover to the home audience that what they're watching is real. Hey guys, come on over, I wanna show you something. You guys got a moment? Come with me, I wanna show you something. How old are you? Uh, 13. 13, you married? No, no? I get you sure. <laughs> this is, you know what this is, right? I'm gonna see if I can't do a little magic with this pendant. Now to do it, I'm gonna need some magic words. Abracadabra. Abracadabra is good, a little blow. Check this out. Go on. <laughs> you can go back to your folks there. I'm going to try to do this one more time with a different bridge. Thanks, Roy. All right, Doug and Seth, you good? I'm good, Franz. I'm waving the flag and I'm on my mark. Looks beautiful. Yeah. All right. You're about to see something amazing. I hope. The count of three. One, two, three. Oh Whoa. my god! Oh my god! Hello, Father, look good? Yeah, it looks good. <laughs> we got it, guys. <laughs> Rock and roll. Fly away, Peter, fly away, Paul. Come back, Peter, come back, Paul. We all saw that little trick as children. We're all born with a sense of wonder, and it gets knocked out of us pretty early in the game. The secret of all great magical performance is to reawaken that sense of wonder. It can be a very powerful experience. One, two, three. Jeez. 